Thanks for joining my audio developer conference talk titled Knee Deep in Wise, Re-Implementing the Doom Audio Engine. My name's Robin, and today I'd like to take you through my slightly absurd project inserting a state-of-the-art game audio middleware into id Software's 1993 title Doom. Now, I've got a background in electronic and computer music, and I also work as a software developer, but I wanted to learn more about game audio I decided the best thing to do would be to learn the Audio Kinetic Wise uh, C++ framework and associated authoring tools. A project that immediately jumped out to me to learn this would be attempting to integrate Wise into id Software's Doom. And to summarize the goals of the project, I wanted to learn the C++ end of the Wise SDK and also the content authoring tool that comes along with that. I wanted to retain all of the original audio events uh, and also add in some brand new audio events that were not previously part of the game. I wanted to work with spatial audio in, in some way and achieve some sort of convincing acoustics within the game. I wanted everything to be fully dynamic and data driven, so I didn't want to be scripting individual sounds or kind of instances of sonic events in particular levels. I wanted everything to kind of be driven by the engine and by the data that's getting pulled out of the the levels and, and from the character interaction. I also thought about the scope of the project and what compromises I was prepared to make. So I didn't want to do a full rewrite of Doom. Uh, I wasn't worried about this being some sort of, you know, highly polished, releasable thing. It was kind of, you know, better than a hack, uh, but definitely not um, a fully a fully realized uh, project. I decided to limit the, the scope of uh, what I was going to work with to the shareware version of Doom. It was going to work, run on a single platform, and I was also happy to like, break the, the Doom architecture. Okay, so before we really get into the details, this talk is essentially going to be about my approach and my process in working on this project. It's going to cover some lessons that I learned along the way, a little bit about the Doom source where necessary. I'm going to talk about my WISE integration. There's going to be quite a lot about the kind of Doom architecture and the way its data needs to be translated into things which WISE can work with. There's going to be some code examples and there's going to be some gameplay examples showing uh, the new audio that I've worked on. So what is Doom? Uh, Doom was a 1993 first-person shooter released by id Software. It was a genre defining, it set the benchmark for what a first-person shooter could be and was cloned by many, many other software houses. Doom was technically revolutionary. It introduced a whole set of new rendering techniques, which really pushed the limits of what the 486 PC at the time could, could do. It was also highly controversial due to its violence and realism, uh, which undoubtedly led to its popularity and success as a game. Doom was written in ANSI C for the Wacom compiler, and the source code was released as open source in 1997. This open source release spawned countless ports and mods of Doom to all kinds of platforms and hardware. Doom was written in a highly portable, platform-independent way. So they had a, a core, which included all of the, the game logic, and then a hardware wrapper around that, which uh, provided uh, access to the rendering and audio and um, control input. So here I'm referring to uh, Fabian Sanglard's excellent book on Doom and Doom architecture. And here we can see the idea of a core of the game logic surrounded by the various different platform dependent subsystems. So audio in Doom was also very advanced for 1993. Aside from the really iconic sound design and music of the game, sounds were presented to you in a stereo field and attenuated based on their distance from the player. Enemies in Doom also respond to sound and there are algorithms which propagate environmental sound to the AI of the game so the monsters can be woken up when a player fires a gun, for instance. And there are also uh, conduits which allowed sound to propagate around the map so that the level designers could essentially pipe monster noises from one place to another within the level to create kind of dynamic suspense and really freak out the player as they, as they moved around the map. And what about audio kinetic wise? Well, wise is a one of the industry standard middlewares for game audio. Part of the reason it's so popular is it creates this really clean separation between the engine level development implementation of audio logic, like when events are fired, what the parameters of the audio are, and then how those sounds are actually um, constructed from an aesthetic point of view. So a sound designer has a, an authoring tool 
which uh, enables them to set up all kinds of randomization behaviors and map parameters from the game engine into filter cutoffs and uh, attenuation and all kinds of complex behaviors in a really kind of quite familiar digital audio workstation style interface. So it's an event-based system where the engine fires sound events and parameter updates. These are captured by the, uh, the audio uh, implementation and, and turn into sound. And then all of this is kind of boiled down into a series of sound banks, which can be loaded at runtime. Right, so first steps in actually uh, doing some work. I needed uh, some Doom source code to build, and I also needed some kind of wise Hello World uh, C++ project, which would play a sound. So starting with Doom, Doom's of course written in, uh, in C, whereas the audio kinetic wise API is C++. So at this point I did what uh, anyone in my situation would do. I typed C++ Doom into a uh, internet search engine and straight away I found uh, Jason Turner's uh, CPP Doom project from C++ Weekly. We started out as a kind of 11 hour straight port of uh, Crispy Doom, which is um, a C version of Doom uh, into a C++ project which builds as C++. This project uh, builds with CMake, so I was able to um, run a command which would generate an Xcode project out of, uh, out of the CMake. And then with a few tweaks, uh, I was luckily able to get this to build and run. I could load in the shareware Doom data, and then I was able to, to play Doom. So I had a really good starting point here. Digging into the source a little bit, even though it was building a C++, this was a, really still a C project. So you know, there's no namespaces, there's no classes. Um, there's function pointer-based polymorphism, which was really, you know, this whole thing looked quite alien to me. But I was I was able to find a few a few entry points into understanding the code. So there's a there's a kind of play sound method which, um, you know, d does what it says. And I was able to put some breakpoints in and and start understanding some of some of how the logic works for the the audio uh, subsystems. In terms of the wise C plus plus hello world, this was fairly straightforward. I started an empty Xcode project. I followed some of the um, the tutorials on the WISE uh, website and was able to create a program which um, just launches into an infinite loop and plays uh, a sound. The next step was to uh, bring these two things together, which was actually quite fiddly in terms of project configuration. It, I spent the best part of the day bringing in all of the WISE dependencies, putting them into the Doom project and getting it all to build. But in the end, I did get it to work. I was in a situation where I could launch Doom from Xcode, it would run through the wise boilerplate code and play a sound. Okay, so here we are in Xcode. So the first thing is I, I created a load of static methods, which I knew I was gonna change later, but I just made a load of static methods to start with, which I could call from various points in, in the Doom engine without having to create any kind of objects or anything like that. So there's a setup sound method. So actually this gets called over in main. So this is, this is the main for Doom. And there's our setup sound. And then it proceeds on into the rest of the Doom initialization logic. So in our, in our setup sound, uh, I call this init sound engine method. And then this steps through a load of uh, boilerplate code calling into the uh, audio connected wires. Uh, SDK, setting up memory management, and uh, setting up the sound engine, the music engine. Uh, and then this, this part's quite interesting. This is uh, setting up the uh, network communication system, mm -hmm. which enables the game to talk to the uh, authoring package. And so you can, when you post events from the game, you can pull them in into the authoring tool, and you can see, see them arrive in real time, and you can, uh, you can play around with them. And then we load in sound banks. So yeah, hard-coded path to somewhere on my computer which has got the sound banks on it. So obviously this is still really kind of sketchy stuff, but um, this is loading in our, our main sound bank which has got um, a sound in it that we're gonna launch, we're gonna play on launch. We register a game object. So in WISE you have game objects which are things in the world that WISE knows about and that can emit sound and have, have uh, events associated with them. And then we create a listener so the listener is essentially the, where the sounds are arriving. So this would be the player. So we just set up a few things here, some really, really simple things. We give it an ID, we give it a name. And then, uh, and then this is our post event method. So here we're saying play the gong noise. And then the, the only other thing to note here is um, this render audio mm -hmm. call here. So we have to call into 
uh, audio kinetic sound engine render audio. This gets called from within this file iVideo. Where, remember when I talked about the different um, layers of Doom, this is actually in the, the video uh, subsystem. And this is a method which gets called on, essentially on post, uh, post rendering, finish update. And then we call through to render audio. Now, I did actually move the position that this gets called later on into Doom's uh, tick system, which is a kind of AI um, and game logic kind of updating method. So I, I didn't, in the end, have it as associated with the video. But for this early trial, I was calling the render audio from um, the screen rendering callbacks. And that's really it. So if I, if I hit play now, what we should see is Doom uh, starting up, and we should hear a test sound. Now, the other interesting thing I did here was uh, create this play test sound event. So this was just a generic, really simple sound I added in. And I actually hooked this into this the I sound method. So if you, again, if you think back to that, um, the diagram of all the subsystems, in the audio subsystem, which is I, I sound, there's a method here, which is uh, start sound. And so this gets called every time in Doom a sound needs to be played. So I put a few really useful things in here. I put in a, um, a print line, which prints out the name of the sound that should be played. Then I called into my play test sound here. So now the practical upshot of this is that now, any time the Doom engine tried to, to play a sound, uh, I was uh, kind of catching that and, and sending event over to Wise, which was gonna play this uh, beeping noise. So it, it sounded a bit like this. So that was a really good entry point into the project. Uh, back in our start sound method in the audio layer of Doom, you can see our, our log line here. And I've got Doom running in the background. And you can see down here in the console all the different uh, sound effects names being printed. So we've got pistol shot, we've got barrels, we've got explosions, all the various different sounds you'd expect from the game. Now we can also flip over to the WISE authoring tool. And we can see here, these are the events being posted from the game. So every time our playtest event method gets called, we're hearing that beep, which we can see in the, uh, the level meter over here. And then these are all the API calls coming in. This gives you a sense of the kind of workflow for uh, adding sounds into Doom. Now, back over in Xcode, the problem is, if you look at the signature of this method, we've really got, we've got some low level information. We've got the channel, volume, the pitch, and this SFX info struct, which if you open that up, it's really just some more like quite, quite low level information about the sound that's going to be played. There's no real concept here of which entity is generating this sound. Is it a monster? Is it the player? Is it some environmental sound source? All that's been stripped away at this point. And so this is where I realized I would really need to dig quite a lot further into the um, internal logic of the game to really pull out that level of granularity about who's making this sound, where is it in the world, etc. So moving away from those static methods we saw earlier, I decided to use kind of macro level singletons to contain various parts of the architecture that I needed. So I'd have a wrap around the wise calls and, and this would be able to, you better call into this and you know, start the audio engine and load sound banks and, and this sort of thing. And then I had a uh, player singleton, which you could call into and update things like the player's location in the map or if it, the player sustained damage or got a, got a power up, for instance. And then a singleton which would control all of the other things in the map, so the enemies and uh, where the power ups were and any kind of state to do with those. And then finally, an environment singleton which was more to do with the uh, managing the acoustics and that sort of thing. Thinking about the player singleton, this manages everything to do with the activities of, of the player. Uh, so it sets up the listener um, and communicates that to WISE. And then you can call into it and update it on the player's position in the map and their rotation. Uh, if they're firing a weapon or sustaining damage or receiving benefits from a power up, for instance, there was methods that you could hook into from the Doom engine to trigger all of these sorts of events. <laughs> 
is a header file and public interface for the player at Singleton. So you can see all these different methods I've created here for the various operations that this class can take care of. So an example of how this would get used is if I flip over to this p user file, which is part of the, the Doom engine, there's a method here, um, player think. Now this will get called within the tick system of Doom. So that gets called at a regular interval and computes a load of updates to the player to do with what they're up to, where they're, where they're moving and their health and any other influences on the player. And I added some extra lines at the bottom here. So I get the instance of the singleton and I'm setting the position of the player. So this would be the updated position after we've recomputed uh, their movement. And I pass in X, Y, Z and the angle. I can check if they're on the ground here or if they're floating in the air, if they've jumped off something. And I'm also setting the, uh, the floor and ceiling textures. Uh, I'm passing those into my player singleton because they're quite useful for knowing what floor surface the player is walking on. And we can use that to think about different footstep sounds, for instance. Another good example is uh, firing weapons. So there's a whole set of methods within the Doom engine for all the different weapons you can have. So there's firing a pistol, there's firing the shotgun, uh, the chain gun. And in each of these, I call my singleton and I pass in an enum, which tells me which weapon has been fired. So it's the pistol or it's the shotgun, for instance. And now in the implementation for the fire weapon method, you can see we take the weapon type enum and we just switch on it. And we choose which wise event we're going to post into the audio engine. So whether that's the fist or the shotgun or the pistol, uh, that's, that's the event that gets chosen and sent off to play the appropriate sound. Now, I don't really like this kind of uh, large switch statement style uh, programming, but, uh, but unfortunately there was quite a lot of this in the project simply because of the way uh, Doom handles its, its data and there's just like lots of enums that get passed around. I, I kind of decided to just go with this and, and live with it rather than trying to really develop a much more elegant solution, but probably something like a map would have been a better choice here. Similarly, for the floor texture, as the player moves around the map and walks on different floor textures, I can look for certain values I picked out and update a switch within uh, the audio engine to determine different uh, floor types. So for instance, I have uh, carpet or dirt. I've got concrete. and mucage, which is the, uh, the toxic slime. <coughs> so these values, for instance, 23, 113, 124, these are texture numbers that come from the game data. And I've just had to find these through trial and error just by breakpointing and, and logging out uh, the floor texture and then deciding what, what to map those to within, within the, uh, the audio. So this is, this is kind of an example of how I've, I've kind of broken the architecture of Doom a little bit because I'm really you know, hard coding values here. So if we change the game data, then this wouldn't behave properly. And so this is part of the reason I decided to uh, limit myself to just working with the shareware levels and not really worrying about making this all completely decoupled and uh, independent. Before we move on from the player, I'd like to say a little bit about footsteps. The original Doom didn't actually have footstep sounds. But this was something I wanted to add in because it would be an easy way to experiment with uh, switches and, as we've seen, different floor textures causing different footstep sounds. So in more modern game engines, you might trigger a footstep sound from uh, a collision event or from a stage in an animation, for instance, when the player's foot hits the ground, you could trigger a sound. But in Doom, we don't have any meshes or these kind of foot collision events and there's no, there's no animations. I mean, there's no feet for the main player. So I had to figure out another way to calculate the footfall distributions. 
the naive approach, which I took at first, of course, was to just think about how far the player has moved and then trigger a footstep at a certain interval. And this kind of sounded okay if the player was moving at a constant speed, but for most of the time, it really sounded very unconvincing. In the end, I decided to use a velocity-based footfall algorithm. Rather than just looking at the distance the player has moved, I also look at the velocity the player is moving at and then scale that distance threshold by the velocity. So if you're moving very slowly, the distance between footsteps is going to be less because you're kind of shuffling along. Whereas if you're at a running speed, the footsteps are going to be further apart. So the footfalls will happen at a greater distance. As an aside, someone on Reddit uh, has calculated that the, the main character in Doom moves at almost 50 miles an hour. So the footfall sounds were always going to be a bit of a weird thing to place. And I had to kind of use my subjectivity to decide what I thought sounded good. <laughs> Next, we have the map objects. These are the entities other than the player which populate the world. For instance, the enemies. The power-ups and pieces of furniture dotted around the level. but also more fleeting objects, for instance, a projectile or a uh, puff of dust, which appears momentarily. To handle all of this, I wrote a fluent interface which could define various parameters and behaviors a map object could take. And then I wrote a factory method which would produce instances as required. map objects are managed via a map object strut. There's actually a uh, spawn map object method which gets called every time something gets added to the level, whether this is everything that gets populated at the start or the fleeting objects I described like the projectiles. At the bottom of this method, I call into my map singleton and pass in the details of the new map object that's been created now, some of you may be wondering about this reinterpret cast into long, long. So this is a convention I uh, arrived at for taking a pointer to a map object and converting it into a unique ID, which I could then use to define my game objects within WISE. And then I pass in the sprite, the position, and so on. Over on the implementation side, there's a number of factory methods which can create map objects of different kinds. And this is another example of the, uh, the large amount of switching I mentioned earlier. In this case, there's a sprite enum, which is the only way to distinguish different types of map objects from each other. For instance, there's a candelabra. There's the burning barrels. There's the techno pillar. The, the puff of smoke, the splatter of blood. When we create one of these map objects, I can pass in 
a unique wise ID, which defines the sound that that object can make. For the more complex map objects, like the monsters, I have a fluent interface, which allows me to pass in lots of different wise event types for the different behaviors that that, uh, that entity can exhibit. For instance, the zombie man um, can fire, and so he has a shoot wise event. He's also got a pain sound, a die sound, uh, an alert sound. And so using this fluent interface, I'm able to quite clearly and readably uh, set up all of these different behaviors and script in all the different sounds uh, that correspond. So if you remember back at the start, I said I wanted to introduce some totally new sounds into the game. Now, one of the nice side effects of this approach was uh, a lot of these game objects that get created, for instance, the, the puff, which is like a ricochet, like when, when a bullet hits a wall, uh, you get this little puff of smoke. There's, there was no audio event for that in the original game, but because I was essentially listening for every new game object that gets created, it was very easy to, to add some extra sonic events in this way. Whilst the Doom code seemed very alien at first, after a week or so of working with it, it really started to become a lot more familiar. And I realized it has a very strong uh, internal consistency and logic to it, which really helped me to uh, make progress in the project. For instance, updating the map objects was very similar to the way the player updates. There's an enemy source file, and within that there's a move method, which calculates the new uh, positions of map objects. So I could simply tap into that, collect my ID in the same way as I mentioned earlier, and then pass in the new updated uh, coordinates and angle. On the other side of that function call, we take in the ID and the coordinates, and then I have a map of IDs to map objects. Uh, so I can retrieve uh, my map object and then set the position on it. So every tick, all of the active map objects get updated in this way. You can also see here methods for when various events happen on the enemy. So for instance, when they die or they are alerted or they make a melee sound, for instance. <laughs> To quickly recap at this point, I guess I've been working on the project for a couple of weeks. Uh, so we've got behavior around the player, so we've got weapon sounds, we've got the footsteps, we've got the map objects and enemies, we've got some environmental sounds and some new audio events like the ricochet noise. Uh, but I, I discovered there was a bit of a problem. There's actually no, no sound occlusion. So it was almost like all of the sounds in the game were happening in some huge space with no kind of partitioning at all. So even though you could be uh, on one side of a wall, you could hear sounds from the other side of the wall as if the wall wasn't there. And this was completely unrealistic and kind of interfered with the, some of the suspense that was built into the way the levels had been put together. The solution I saw was to look at the WISE uh, Spatial Audio API, which allows you to construct uh, acoustic walls which can affect sound propagation. This seemed like quite an ambitious but necessary uh, aspect of the project and required taking the map geometry from the Doom engine uh, and translating that into something which WISE would be able to understand. And then from that point on, I would be able to build in occlusion and actually quite a lot of other things uh, as well. The geometry API in WISE is based around triangles. So it's quite similar to uh, OpenGL in that sense. You assemble complex shapes out of uh, multiple triangles, and then you can apply an acoustic material, which is a bit like a texture, but which can impart sound filtering properties onto that material. So it can occlude or it can dampen or filter in other ways. One of the challenges here is that Doom's geometry isn't really 3D. It's more like 2D, where we have a top-down view of all the walls and some height information and different pieces of geometry kind of grouped together into things called sectors. But there's no set of coordinates or polygons which you can just get which describe the entire map. If you've ever played Doom and you hit tab, you go to the map view. Now this is actually quite close to a lot of how the engine really works under the hood. And to create the truly 3D geometry that WISE uses, I had to do a bit of uh, filling in the dots. So to create a 3D wall, you've got to take the plan view and duplicate all those points 
and then set them at the floor height and then offset that again by the, uh, the height of the ceiling. And then you've got uh, a set of uh, points which describe all the rectangles. And then you can turn each of those rectangles into two triangles by dissecting them along the, the center. And then from that, I was able to group those into more kind of coherent units of geometry, which describe kind of sections of the map and pass those into the WISE uh, spatial audio API. So one of the nice things about this is uh, you can view all of the, uh, the polygons within WISE. So you can see what the, uh, the audio API is doing. And you can see here as the player moves around the, the classic E1M1 map, uh, different parts of the geometry are constructed. And this was something I had to implement to improve the efficiency of the API calls because it was too much to be adding in all of the geometry at once. And from the more familiar first person perspective, the circle in the center is actually the game object that represents the player. And you'll notice there's no flaws. This is actually fine because in Doom, there are no rooms above rooms. This is a limitation of the way the rendering engine works. So there wasn't really any need to add uh, acoustic surfaces representing the floors. Also here, you'll see there's some uh, windows. This was a simplification on my part. Uh, anywhere there is a window, I simply didn't add a polygon at all. This is another view of the same map. And in a moment, you'll be able to see how as the player turns this corner, a whole load of new sounds suddenly become audible to them that were previously being blocked by the uh, surfaces which were occluding the sound. So the additional benefit to importing all of the geometry into WISE is, uh, well, first of all, it's very easy to configure the occlusion behaviors within the authoring tool once all of the geometry is in place. And secondly, we can add the WISE Reflect plugin, which calculates the uh, early onset portion of room reflections. And it does this by calculating the amount of delay that will be applied to signals as they bounce off different pieces of uh, geometry around the listener. Okay, another quick recap. So we've got, uh, we've got the player, we've got enemies, we've got some static, uh, objects in the world which are making sound. We've now got reflection and occlusion, and things are really starting to sound pretty good at this point. I'd added in the wise reflect, so I was getting some sort of sense of uh, of the spaces uh, being simulated. But I wanted to add some more uh, convincing reverb and room acoustics, and also add some environmental sounds, which will be procedurally placed based on textures which existed in the map. So the goal of the dynamic reverb would be creating some convincing acoustics based on the properties of the space that the player found themselves in. So different size rooms or corridors or large halls or exterior locations. So the challenge here really was that based on what we know about the, uh, the geometry that Doom provides us with, there's no high level descriptors of different rooms or areas of the map. All we really have is uh, some kind of partial coordinates and some information about the textures that are in those spaces. Thinking about this for a while, I realized what I needed was some way to analyze the map geometry and create more high level groupings of pieces of the map, essentially uh, grouping bits of, bits of geometry into kind of coherent runes, which I could then perform some sort of analysis on and determine some sort of reverb properties that would be in that space. I'm doing a bit of reading around this. I came across this idea of the uh, R tree algorithm. And um, one of the things you can use an R tree for is to determine if polygons are inside other polygons. So the plan here, and I prototyped this in uh, processing uh, rather than writing it straight into the, the Doom engine, was to take all the geometry for the map, figure out which bits of the geometry fell inside other bits of the geometry. And once you've done all of that for all of the pieces of geometry, 
you would have some kind of groupings of uh, what would probably be room-like structures. And then from there, I could look at things like, is this an interior or exterior setting by looking at the ceiling texture, for instance, and seeing if it's the sky or if it's a, a ceiling in of a room. I could also look at things like the number of windows in the space and come up with some notion of how interior this space was. And I could also look at things like uh, the volume of this space or the ratio of the, the floor area to the length of the walls, which might tell me something else about the qualities of this space. The easiest way for you to see how this actually worked is for me to show you the uh, processing sketch I wrote, which plots all the map geometry onto the screen and allowed me to kind of visually iterate over the algorithm before bringing it into the Doom engine. This is the E1M1 map. Now, as you can see, the map is really constructed from these individual sectors, which are small kind of atomic pieces of geometry. Now, what I wanted to achieve was grouping together areas of the map, which kind of made sense from a more architectural point of view. The algorithm starts by placing a bounding box around each sector. From there, we work out the area of the bounding box. And then I take all of the sectors and sort them into size order from biggest all the way down to smallest. The next stage is to start with the largest sector and then move down to the second largest sector and see if that bounding box is inside the first sector. Now, if it is, or it overlaps to a certain amount, we would associate those two things together in the R tree. So we would place the, uh, the interior sector as a leaf node of the larger sector. If we find a sector which is not part of any of the other sectors, that becomes a new top level node in the tree. And then we proceed on from biggest all the way down to smallest, placing nodes inside each other at the furthest depth we could find until we processed all of the sectors of the map. At this point, we would go from having individual sectors like these to having more conceptual groupings like this. If we look at this particular area as an example, this is the raised platform area in the first level. The colors mean different things. A blue line means that that piece of the geometry is exterior. And I decide that by looking at the ceiling texture. If it's the sky, then I assume it's an outside area. The red lines are solid walls, and the yellow lines are windows or incomplete shapes. Based on this, I can then arrive at some more high-level descriptions of this piece of architecture. In this instance, saying that this piece of architecture is about 90% exterior, about 60% of it is solid walls. This is its volume, this is its area, and a few other metrics. This one here is all interior, and half of the walls are solid. I wrote this code separately in processing, so I could draw to a screen and see the algorithm working. But I wrote it in a way that I would be able to easily copy and paste it into the Doom engine and tweak some of the syntax to change it into C++. Here you can see some of the classes, the vertex, the wall, the sector. There's also a bounding box class, which has methods to uh, get its width and height and the method to determine if it is inside or outside of another bounding box. This is the R-tree data structure itself. It has a method to add a node, which is another R-tree. I also wrote a really primitive unit testing framework inside processing so I could test all my calculations were correct. Everything gets pre-computed on level load, so it doesn't really add a lot of computational overhead. The only thing that needs to happen whilst the game is being played is looking up the current piece of architecture that you're in and setting some reverb send levels within WISE. There are four overall reverb buses. There's an exterior, a corridor, a large room, and a small room. These reverb send levels are derived from the high level architectural descriptions stored within the R tree. For instance, the exterior send level is based on the exterior value we discussed earlier. There's also some conditional checks to see how large a room is and whether it should go to the large or small reverb. I arrived at these equations purely through trial and error, and there's no real science to the mappings. It was based on my uh, own subjective opinion about what sounded good. Mm -hmm.
I think one of the finishing touches to this project was adding some more environmental sounds procedurally uh, into the into the mass. And I did this quite simply by inspecting the various textures around the level, and looking for particular textures that I had identified. For instance, the computers or kind of water or liquid things which look like ventilation or neon lights, or if there was a sky, placing game objects in those spaces and playing these ambient sounds to really bring to life the levels in a way that we haven't really heard before. We're near the end of the talk now, and I'd just like to summarize and wrap up a little bit. This was about a month's work for me, all told, including a lot of trial and error and a lot of reading around to understand how the Doom Source worked and also really digging into the WISE API documentation. Uh, but I've shown you how I set up the player and listener, how enemies and map objects were updated and controlled within the game. I then talked to you about how I use the WISE geometry API to control for occlusion and reflections. And then my approach to simulating dynamic reverbs using my artery-based geometry analyzer to compute some high-level descriptions of the level architecture. I've also talked about how I broke some of the Doom architecture by jumping around the source and, and breaking the kind of layering that I talked about earlier. In terms of lessons for WISE, I would say one thing that I didn't do and that I really wish I had done was come up with some sort of plan before I started working in the authoring tool. You really need to think about how entities in your world relate to each other. For instance, different kinds of monsters or NPCs or furniture within a level or environmental sounds and how these entities could be grouped inside mixer hierarchies in a way that makes it ex extendable and easy for you to add and change aspects of your sound design. Now, I didn't really do this because I wasn't sure when I started how the authoring tool works or what a, a good project should look like. And in some cases, I really painted myself into a corner with the way I'd organized the project. So coming up with a plan in terms of entities and their mixer structure would really have helped me. In terms of building a portfolio, I think working on something which is really, really familiar like Doom is a great conversation starter. It's very easy for people to identify what you've done and see the changes from the uh, original game to a modified version of it. I think working on an old game is still a really valid experience and working on a full game as opposed to a kind of technical demo or sample project really gets you a sense of the breadth of the source code and all of the different edge cases and features of the game that you need to consider when integrating an audio middleware. There's, of course, lots of other open source games out there. There's other, other games by id Software like Quake or Wolfenstein. There's also all of the build engine games like Duke Nukem 3D. You can get the Half-Life source code. There's also open source rebuildings of other classic games. For instance, the open rewrite of GTA 3. And of course, things like Open Transport Tycoon. If you go onto Wikipedia, you can find an enormous list of open source games. I think it's also really good to add some sort of novelty or innovation to your solutions, even if it's a simple portfolio piece. For instance, in my case, the artery-based geometry classifier adds a flavor of computer science to the project. And finally, some important acknowledgments I'd like to make. Uh, Jason Turner for his work on the CPP Doom project as part of the C++ Weekly channel. Uh, Fabian Sanglard, again, for permission to use some figures earlier on in the talk. Uh, Maximilian and everyone at the Audio Kinetic licensing team for granting me some 
extended licenses on WISE and the spatial audio plugins. Of course, the Audio Developer Conference for having me and hosting this talk and showing interest in my work. Uh, thank you for everyone who voted for this talk, and of course, thank you for listening. If you're interested in anything else that I've worked on, you can go to my website, robinfencourt.com, where you can find my music and my other computing projects. And I'm also happy to answer any questions about uh, this WISE Doom project, so please feel free to email me or add your questions in the comments, and I'll uh, try and find them and answer them. And that's it. Thank you very much. Goodbye.